so I spent some time looking at the some of the general materials and the nature and structure of the materials produced by the General Medical Council and the British Medical Association, because within the period with which the inquiry is most closely concerned, they were the main sources of guidance to doctors. Um, I'm just going to now just briefly refer to some of the other sources without going into the detail of, of what they produced um, before I turn to, to, to some of the key themes. So, um, in addition to the British Medical Association, we have some materials from the World Medical Association. Um, that was established in part on the initiative of the BMA in uh, 1947, and it's produced on an international um, plane uh, ethical guidance to uh, clinicians. We then have as a, um, a group of organizations, a range of royal colleges who've produced uh, material. Um, We've referred to some, um, not uh, every single one of them in, in, in our written notes, but sources of, uh, of relevant guidance include the Royal College of Physicians, the Royal Colleges of Surgeons, the Royal College of General Practitioners, and so on. And, and we'll look at some of the relevant um, bits and pieces um, um, uh, as I go through some of the, the um, substantive guidance. Um, we then um, have... Uh, some guidance emanating from those concerned with the world of nursing. So the Royal College of Nursing, which is essentially performs a similar function to the, to the BMA that the nurses. So it's a, a membership organisation um, uh, um, um, and trade union, and, and it's produced guidance to nurses, much of which is also um, relevant to the issues which the inquiry is exploring. And then we have the Nursing and Midwifery Council, previously called the United Kingdom Central Council for Nursing, Midwif Midwifery and Health. That's the nursing equivalent of the General Medical Council. And again, it's produced some um, relevant guidance that we'll, we'll look at. Um, the, the next category of organisations that have produced relevant materials are the medical defence organisations. So there are several such organisations in, in the United Kingdom. The principal ones for our purposes are the Medical Defence Union, the Medical Protection Society, and the Medical and Dental Defence Union of Scotland. Now, they're, they're not regulators. They're bodies that exist to advise and assist doctors, in particular facing complaints or, complacing litigation, or, or, or facing litigation. And you may recall, sir, the evidence of the medical ethics group that one of the purposes of these medical defence organisations or societies is to help and protect and prevent doctors from being sued. So there, the materials they produce are very much focused upon um, they're being clinician-centred rather than patient-focused. But nonetheless, there's some important material, not least on consent, um, that emanates in particular from the Medical Defence Union. Um, uh, and then um, there is um, a material, uh, um, some of the material relating to principles of research emanating from the Medical Research Council. Um, there's some material uh, uh, for the uh, practice of the profession of dentists emanating from the General Dental Council, so that's the dental equivalent of the General Medical Council, or from the British Dental Association, which is it, the dental equivalent of the British Medical Association. Um, uh, and then a, a handful of other groups or committees who've produced relevant material over the years, which um, I'll, I'll refer to in our, in our written note and in the chronology the inquiry's produced. Um, and then finally, there, when we come to look at, at what will be the last topic I explore today, um, this afternoon, which is some of the guidance about relationships between clinicians and pharmaceutical companies, there's material produced by the Association um, of the British Pharmaceutical Industry. So those are the sources, or the principal sources, of the material um, that, that we've been looking at. Um, and having identified those organisations, what I now want to do is to look in a little more detail at the guidance that has been produced over the, 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 the earlier decades with which the in inquiry is, is concerned on the issue of consent and consent to treatment and informed consent. And we can pick that up in 1953 with some material produced by the Medical Defence Union, so one of these medical defence societies um, acting for doctors. Shemek, if we could have, please, MOJU 601 underscore 013. 
This was a letter written by the Secretary of the Medical Defence Union in April 1953 um, to Dr Snell of the Prison Commission. And the particular issue with which it was concerned was um, consent to um, the performance of medical procedures on prisoners, uh, and in particular whether the governor of, of a prisoner or of a borstal institution, as young offender institutions were then known, um, could give a consent on behalf of a prisoner. So not, not, not the situation with which we're concerned, but that's the context for the material that we see. Um, this letter uh, um, then addressed to, to the uh, 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 prison commission uh, identifies that issue in the first paragraph. It says, I would not readily concede that your view is correct, that consent given with, by governor of a prison or borstal institution is of no legal value with regard to the performance of an operation or the administration of an anaesthetic. Um, and then reference to the, what the duties of a governor um, um, of a prison might be in terms of responsibility for the well-being and care of prisoners. Um, if we just go over the page and see um, that the MDU secretary says, and it's the last, um, it's the first paragraph, last sentence, I'm enclosing here with for your perusal and retention a document on the giving of consent, which I hope you will find interesting and useful. Um, and the purpose of referring to that is that it, it helps um, give some date to the document I'm, I'm, I'm going to um, refer to. So that's... Uh, at MOJU 601 underscore 014. Actually, no, sorry, show me, before we go to that, we just go to MOJU 601 underscore 008. So, Again, emanating from the MDU in the context we think of the correspondence with the Prison Commission was this document, which goes into more detail about issues relating in particular to um, uh, questions of consent as they pertain to prisoners. Um, but we'll just, I just wanted to refer to the first few lines. The general law concerning surgical operations performed without the consent of the patient is but briefly dealt with in the books, and there seems to be little authority and then this reference to Halsbury's laws to perform a surgical operation on a person against his will or against the will of a person entitled to consent on his behalf is an assault. And then this document then goes into detail about, about particular legal issues that might arise in the context of the care of prisoners um, uh, um, and the giving of consent. So this is one of the documents that seems to emanate from this exchange of correspondence in 1953. And then the second and more directly relevant document is MOJU 601 underscore 014. And it may be that this was the booklet being referred to in the MDU secretary's letter to the uh, prison commissioner, um, the prison commission. Um, so you'll see it's headed the Medical Defence Union Limited Consent for Examination and Treatment. And, and it says this, it is not sufficiently widely known by practitioners that in law, consent must be given by a patient before an examination can be conducted or treatment administered. Fortunately, doctors are not often challenged in the law courts on the issue of absence of consent, since in the majority of cases, consent can be implied from the nature of the relationship of doctor and patient. But the rarity of such an event may lull practitioners into a false sense of security. The following statement is intended to review and clarify the legal position of the practitioner who proposes a professional examination or advocates any treatment. And then the next paragraph is headed general considerations. Strictly speaking, it is illegal for any practitioner to do anything to any patient without consent. If he acts without consent, he may be held to have committed assault, for which he may be prosecuted in a criminal court, or to have been guilty of trespass, for which he may be sued in a civil court. The person immediately affected may bring an action against the doctor. In some cases, a parent, a spouse, or an employer may also have a right of action. It is therefore necessary to consider what is the meaning and scope of consent, how it should be sought, and by whom it may be given. Now, pausing there, the focus of this is not on ethical principles, but on legal rights and obligations. But nonetheless, it's the earliest document we found issued to, or potentially issued to, or available to doctors, looking specifically um, um, at, at this issue. Um, and then we can see the heading, the significance of consent, 
Um, consent means that the individual concerned, either by himself or with or through another, has indicated by implication or specifically, preferably in writing, that he is willing to submit himself for examination and for treatment. Um, and then there's a um, discussion of, of how consent can be oral um, or, or as a, um, preferably written. Um, the, consent, the question of consent, so this is the next paragraph, is not often raised since the parties concerned sh could be shown by their consent to have mutually understood the position, to have implied consent on the one hand and the acceptance of professional responsibility on the other and to, and to have dealt with one another accordingly. Um, and then if we go to the bottom of the page, um, and this is really where we get the concept of informed consent in this document, the request for consent is the heading. To obtain consent, it is necessary for the practitioner to explain carefully to the patient in non-technical language the need for an examination to arrive at a diagnosis or decide on the line of treatment. The character and the likely results of the treatment should be outlined to the patient in such terms that he can appreciate fully what is proposed and what may ensue. A practitioner aware of the uncertainties of treatment should avoid sweeping promises and should not minimise the risks that may be inherent in the procedure he proposes. Um, and then the, the paragraph continues, if the patient is one with whom it would be undesirable for psychological or other reasons to discuss these matters, a different procedure may justifiably be adopted in which the information is placed before some near relative who by himself or preferably in conjunction with the patient gives consent to the treatment. The consent thus obtained must be genuine consent, not merely an apathetic acquiescence, but a real expressed willingness by the patient to undergo the treatment after he has had its nature its risks and its objective clearly explained. And then the document goes on to deal with certain specific cases, including the unconscious patient or the patient who lacks capacity or, or, or children, um, with which I, I don't think I need to, 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 to take up um, your time, sir. But we can see here in, in 1953, the Medical Defence Union, so the the, the, the body involved in trying to, uh, 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 as it were, represent the interests of doctors, here articulating the need for the risks involved in treatment to be spelt out to the patient. And um, there's a further document produced by the MDU in 1962. That's, it's at DHSC 01000. Eight one, please, Shamek. And you'll see from the title, Consent to Operative Treatment, that it's concerned essentially with surgery. Um, but nonetheless, um, um, the, the underlying principles are of some importance. Um, so if we go to the third page, and if we could zoom in on the right-hand side, Consent to Operative Treatment, it says this. A person suffering from disease or injury is not normally bound to submit himself to medical treatment or even to consult a doctor if he does not wish to do so. It follows, therefore, that an operation carried out without the consent of the person concerned, subject to certain exceptions to which reference will be made in due course, amounts to an actionable assault. As such an assault may lead to an action for damages under the civil law, and it follows, therefore, that if a surgeon performs an unauthorised operation, he or his employing authority or both may be confronted with an action for assault for which damages may be recoverable. So again, the focus is on protecting the doctor from uh, litigation, uh, but there, again, the importance of consent being emphasised. And then we see the heading, consent may be expressed or implied, um, uh, and that's discussed in the first paragraph. Um, and it said um, all these forms of consent um, may be equally uh, efficacious. Uh, but if we pick it up in the second paragraph under that heading, to be an effective answer to a claim for assault, the consent must be fully and freely given. The patient should be given a fair and reasonable explanation in non-technical language of the effect and nature of the operation. Um, this should be given only by a person who's competent and qualified to do it, preferably by a medical practitioner. If an, adequate, if an inadequate or misleading explanation is given, there is the danger that the apparent consent obtained will be held to be ineffective. If the operation contemplated carries special risks, which are probably unknown to the patient, he should, as a general rule, be informed of these risks. Um, and then 
and this perhaps may reflect the paternalism of the, of, of the era, uh, it continues, the surgeon may, of course, on occasion be justified in not revealing or in minimising the risk involved if he thinks it necessary to do so in the interests of the patient. Um, and there's a reference to a, perhaps it would now be regarded as a somewhat surprising dis decision of the courts in a case of it, it's, it's interesting that in, yeah. in one respect, the 1953 uh, advice is wider than this because it talks about and what may follow, being yes. advised of not only the what's inherent in the procedure and its risks, but what may follow, what the consequences are. It's not mentioned here. No, that's right. Um, uh, and I, I mean, it, it, that may be ex explicable by reason of the fact this is very much focused on the question of surgery. So it's the application of the broader principles to the particular context of surgery, where the focus may be on the risks inherent in the surgical operation. Yes. Um, and if we just go over the page, again, in the first paragraph on the left-hand side, again, it's in the context of surgery, but a statement of, of, of broader application. A surgeon should not contravene the expression instructions of a patient. And if he goes outside the scope of the authority which has been conferred upon him, he may be liable to the patient for an assault. The fact that he was acting as he thought in the best interest of the patient, that the operation was carefully and skillfully performed and that it was successful, will not afford him any defence if he is sued for assault. And, and then the quote from the case of Venon and Parsonet and this, no amount of professional skill can justify the substitution of the will of the surgeon for that of the patient. And, and, and that's perhaps a... A, a, a pithy but um, useful um, summary, succinct summary of, of, of one of the core underlying principles. Um, so that's the, the 1962 publication on consent to operative treatment. Um, we can then see um, a further booklet still emanating from the Medical Defence Union in 1966. If we go to DHSC 010. Three two four six, please, Shamik. So this is consent to treatment, not limited here to, um, to to surgical treatment, operative treatment. We go to the second page. We'll see the date at the bottom of the page, September nineteen sixty six. We go to the third page. We will see as it were, elevated to, to an important status at the forefront of this document, the, the, the extract from the case that I just referred to, um, that famous quote, no amount of professional skill can justify the substitution of the will of the surgeon for that of his patient. And then if we go to the next page, we see the heading consent to treatment. And so this is in similar terms to the 1962 document, but as I say, now dealing more broadly with treatment generally rather than solely surgery. A person suffering from disease or injury is not normally bound to submit himself to medical treatment or even to consult a doctor if he does not wish to do so. It follows that treatment carried out without the consent of the person concerned, subject to certain exceptions to which reference will be made, can amount to an assault which may lead to an action for damages. Then the example is given of a surgeon, and then it continues, this memorandum considers principally the position of the surgeon but the advice given applies to all forms of treatment which involve physical contact with the patient's body. And again, the, the focus here is on, on, on the doctor not being sued, so it's looking at the, 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 the concept of assault. But the underlying principles, um, as, as, as we learnt from the expert medical group, are of much wider application and, and are limited simply to interactions that involve physical contact between the healthcare practitioner and, and, and the patient. Um, and then if we look at the heading consent may be expressed or implied, if we look at the last paragraph on this page, and we can see in similar form to the 1962 guidance to be an effective answer to a claim for assault. So again, that, that's the focus here. The consent must have been fully and freely given. The patient should therefore be told in non-technical language of the nature and effect of the operation. Um, and then again, reference to special risks unknown to the patient should be, um, the patient should be informed of those risks. Um, th this booklet produced by the MDU, the Consent to Treatment booklet, was then um, updated on a number of occasions over the years. I'm, I'm not going to go through all the different versions. We've given um, the dates in our note of the various occasions on which it was um, updated. 
Um, I, I want to go, um, however, to the 1986 version of this, so we can see how it, the um, way in which the guidance is expressed has changed. This is MDUN 5064, please show me. So we can see it's consent to treatment. It's produced by the Medical Defence Union. If we go to the third page, we see bottom of the left-hand side, it's 1986. Um, and then on the right-hand side, um, we see uh, the concept of informed consent there set out. A doctor has a duty to explain to the patient in non-technical language the nature, purpose, and material risks of the proposed procedure. The patient must be capable of understanding the explanation given, and then there's a reference to the position of the patient who lacks capacity. Again, we're not concerned with that particular situation. Where the patient has been given insufficient information, the doctor may be found to have been in breach of his duty and liable to the patient if damage results. And then we see a discussion of types of consent, implied consent, express consent, oral consent. If we go over the page, written consent. And then if we look at the heading halfway down the left-hand side, obtaining consent, explanation by a knowledgeable doctor, consent should be obtained by a medical practitioner who should be familiar with the details and risks of the proposed operation or investigation. And then if we go to the next page, You'll see here, sir, if we look at the um, bottom of the left-hand side under the heading material risks, reference to um, uh, um, what are in, in legal terms it's the fairly well-known authority of Sidaway and Bethlehem Royal Hospital. So again, the focus here is, is, is on what the minimum that the doctor must do in order to act in accordance um, with the law. Um, and we have there set out what um, was said by the House of Lords uh, in that case. Um, so that's the, the 1986 guidance. And if we then just look at, I think it's the 1993 version, just to see again how the emphasis shifts over the years. Um, MDUN 5065, please, Shamek. Um, this is the document same booklet essentially consent to treatment but produced in 1993 here we can see now on the front page of it we have the definition of consent set out um, express willingness give permission agree voluntary agreement permission compliance and then if we go to page two under the heading consent to treatment on the left hand side what we see now is the language of patient rights so um, left T top of the left-hand side, every patient has the right to make his or her own decision regarding medical treatment and care, and in order to make that decision, is entitled to have full information about the material risks. The clinician's duty is to supply the information in sufficient detail to enable the patient to make that decision. Um, and, and then um, further guidance is then, then given... Um, and, and reference again to various legal principles, um, um, cases and legislative provisions. But what we see here, missing from the earlier versions, is the recognition here of the patient's right. Um, and I, I won't go to it, but when we look, if we were to look at the 1996 version of this, we then see the concept of autonomy being introduced as well. Um, so that's the material produced by the Medical Defence Union on the issue of consent over some of the, the uh, earlier decades. Um, if we can then look at um, some of the material produced by the British Medical Association on the issue of consent and go back to a document I look, we looked at briefly before the break. So this is the BMA's 1980 publication, BMAL, 5087, please, Shamik. 
And if we go to page 10, we see at the bottom of the page the heading consent. The patient's trust that his consent to treatment will not be misused is an essential part of his relationship with his doctor. Um, but for a doctor to touch a patient without consent is an assault. Consent is valid when freely given if the patient understands the nature and consequences of what is proposed. Assumed consent or consent obtained by undue influence is valueless. Um, uh, and then um, paragraph 1.9, bottom of the page, the necessary degree of understanding of what is proposed depends on the patient's education and intelligence, the seriousness and urgency of the condition being investigated or treated and other relevant factors. And then this, the onus is always on the doctor carrying out the procedure to see that an adequate explanation is given. Um, and then there's a section on consent of minors um, uh, and incapacity to consent. So not much in this, but it is um, um, at least for the, for the first time in terms of the BMA materials an articulation of, of the principle of consent in any event. And that's 1980. The World Medical Association in 1981 adopted something called the Declaration of Lisbon. And that is at RLIT 301509. We can see it's headed World Medical Association, the World Medical Association Declaration of Lisbon on the Rights of the Patient. So again, it uses the language of patient rights. Adopted by the 34th World Medical Assembly, Lisbon, Portugal, September, October 1981. Recognising that there may be practical, ethical or legal difficulties, a physician should always act according to his or her conscience and always in the best interest of the patient. The following declaration represents some of the principal rights which the medical profession seeks to provide to patients. Uh, whenever legislation or government action denies these rights of the patient, physicians should seek by appropriate means to assure or to restore them. Um, and then, um, for the present purposes, looking at the question of um, consent, it's, it's C that's important. The patient has the right to accept or to refuse treatment after receiving adequate information. Um, so that's, again, the, the concept of, of patient rights and informed consent. Now, that's obviously expressed in fairly short and succinct terms. Um, this declaration was amended in 1995, so some years later. If we go to RLIT 301508, um, uh, we can see um, this is uh, September 1995, uh, World Medical Association Declaration of Lisbon on the Rights of the Patient, and we can see amended by the 47th General Assembly, Bali, Indonesia, September 1995. And then there's a preamble, which um, is, is perhaps worth looking at because it introduces some of the, those ethical norms that the expert group told us about. The relationship between physicians, their patients, and broader society has undergone sufficient, significant changes in recent times. While a physician should always act according to his or her conscience and always in the best interest of the patient, equal effort must be made to guarantee patient autonomy and justice. The following declaration represents some of the principal rights of the patient, which the medical profession endorses and promotes. Physicians and other persons or bodies involved in the provision of healthcare have a joint responsibility to recognise and uphold these rights. Um, and if we look at the principles then towards the bottom of the page, we'll see the first principle is the right to medical care um, of good quality. And, and 1C refers to the patient shall always be treated in accordance with his or her best interests. And then if we go over the page, we can see at paragraph 3, or principle 3, right to um, uh, self-determination. The patient has the right to self-determination, to make free decisions regarding himself slash herself. The physician will inform the patient of the consequences of his or her decisions. 
a mentally competent adult patient has the right to give or withhold consent to any diagnostic procedure or therapy. The patient has the right to the information necessary to make his or her decisions. The patient should understand clearly what is the purpose of any test or treatment, what the results would imply, and what would be the implications of withholding consent. The patient has the right to refuse to participate in research or the teaching of medicine. Um, and then if we just go to the next page, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to confidentiality later, but principle seven is the right to information. Um, the patient has the right to receive information about himself, herself, recorded in any of his, her medical records and to be fully informed about his, her health status, including the medical facts about his, her condition. Um, confidential information in the patient's records about a third party should not be given to the patient without the consent of that third party. Exceptionally, information may be withheld from the patient when there's good reason to believe that this information would create a serious hazard to his or her life or health. Um, uh, and then various other matters about the patient's rights. Um, so a more detailed exposition here in, in this amended version of the Declaration of Lisbon of, of, of patient rights based clearly upon the principle of, of autonomy. Well, it, it, yes, but um, the way in which uh, autonomy was explained by the ethical experts included uh, the right to make a choice, uh, a choice between no treatment and treatment, but also a choice between the treatment options available. Uh, and none of the, uh, de the statements you've taken me to so far have, have made any explicit reference to a right to choose alternative therapies they don't. which might be available. No. No, that's absolutely right. Uh, nor does it say that information um, explicitly doesn't say um, sorry, it doesn't say explicitly um, that uh, information should be given about options, which is the, the basic, uh, a basic principle which the ethical experts were, were articulating. Uh, no, you're absolutely right, sir. And of course, one of the uh, objectives in, in showing this material, this guidance, is not only for what it does say, but also for, to see what it does not say. And, and what was absent from, from uh, the, the materials that were being um, disseminated to clinicians at the relevant time. I mean, with modern eyes, one could say the principle of mutual respect, going back to 1953, um, has within it the, the right to, do, to know of what the options are, where there are options. Yes. But that, that's reading in with modern eyes what was not ex expressly there in the text at the time. Uh, yes, and, and I, I'll, I'll check as we go through it, but I don't think in the materials that we're looking at from the 70s, 80s or early 90s, we'll see anything that articulates that, that right to make a choice in quite the way that, that you have done so or the way in which the expert group did. Uh, and that may be one of the deficiencies of the material that was promulgated. Yeah. Um, so that, that's the, the Declaration of Lisbon in its um, 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 various, uh, in its amended form. Um, if we then, returning to the publications of the BMA, um, we looked at, um, I've looked at the 1980 guidance, but it's really the 1988 guidance um, where we see a more detailed examination of the principles of consent, but that's at BMAL 5080. So we looked at this before the break in terms of seeing um, what, what kind of general steer was being given by um, the British Medical Association. Um, if we go to the section that's specifically on consent, if I can find it. so it's chapter four, um, page 35, shall I make? And we do here have reference to options, sir. So consent to treatment, 
The basis of any discussion about consent is that a patient gives consent before any investigation and treatment proposed by the doctor. Doctors offer advice, but the patient decides whether to accept it. Before a patient can consent, the options have to be presented in such a fashion as to allow a decision to be made. Consent must involve the ability to choose. So this, I think, is probably the first reference we see in the materials to, to the point that um, you articulated, sir. Um, uh, and then there's the discussion about the, the position of the, the, the patient who doesn't want to be told, um, uh, uh, which is articulated in the remainder of that paragraph. Uh, and then um, picking it up in the next paragraph, normally the patient will wish to decide the doctor should remember that his specialised training and knowledge puts him in a powerful position compared with the patient who will usually lack the detailed knowledge to grasp the essential facts immediately. The lack of this knowledge does not mean that the patient is unable to understand. Consent without understanding is invalid and it is the doctor's moral, professional and legal duty to help the patient reach this understanding. In so doing, the doctor should follow the patient's lead and present as many of the risks and benefits as the patient needs to know. And naturally, a doctor can only discuss matters in relation to the accepted state of medical knowledge um, at the time. One of the problems about consent is that it must follow the disclosure of information and thus understanding of the medical condition. And then there's reference um, to UK case law um, and the Sidaway case. But very importantly, the last two sentences of this first paragraph, after referring to the, 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 the case law, it is important to remember that a doctor's legal obligations are much less than his moral obligations. The legal minimum is not necessarily ethical. Um, and then there is a discussion um, of, of, of certain exceptions, including the, the, the patient um, who lacks capacity um, and the, the statutory provisions that enable compulsory treatment in certain circumstances of psychiatric patients. Um, if we go to... Page 39, I think, Shamik. Um, bottom of the page, uh, under the heading Obtaining Consent, um, it says this, at times consent is implied as in attendance for an inoculation, which implies that the patient expects the inoculation. This does not, however, absolve the doctor from explaining any risks. Uh, equally, there are times when oral consent is not sufficient and written consent essential, it's important that consent should be free from any form of pressure or coercion. And then if we go over the page, we can just see after the extract from what the, doc, the GMC has said about the relationship between doctors and patients, um, the, the point about trust, the doctor-patient relationship is based on trust. Um, so that's the, the 1988 guidance um, from the BMA in, in relation to consent. Uh, if we then I think move to 1990 for the next material publication, that's uh, a publication, I think, by the Department of Health. Um, NHBT 307444 underscore 001, please show me. Or it's an NHS publication, I should say. So it's called A Guide to Consent for Examination or Treatment, and you'll see it's published by the NHS Management Executive. Um, trying to see if we've got an actual date recorded on the document. Our understanding is that this is from August 1990 in any event. Um, if we go to um, the second page, because um, I'm not going to go through each chapter, you'll see there what the, the chapters cover, the, the patient's rights in accepting treatment, health professionals' role in advising the patient, reference to a specific statutory provision, examples of treatment which have raised concern, consent by patients suffering from mental disorder, and then the Sidaway case. If we just go to the next page, what you'll see uh, is that this is very much focused on on legal rights and responsibilities rather than ethical ones. And, and we see that from paragraph one, a patient has the right under common law to give or withhold consent prior to examination or treatment. This is one of the basic principles of healthcare. And then pa paragraph two, patients are entitled to receive sufficient information in a way they can understand about the proposed treatments, the possible alternatives, so there again we get the concept of options and choice um, um, emerging, 
and any substantial risks so that they can make a balanced judgment. Patients must be allowed to decide whether they will agree to the treatment and they may refuse treatment or withdraw consent to treatment at any time. Three, care should be taken to respect uh, the patient's wishes. Um, and then if we go to the next page, under the heading advising the patient, paragraph one, where a choice of treatment might reasonably be offered, the health professional may always advise the patient of his or her recommendations, together with reasons for selecting a particular course of action. Enough information must normally be given to ensure that they understand the nature, consequences, and any substantial risks of the treatment proposed so that they're able to take a decision based on that information. Uh, and then uh, if we go to paragraph four, further down the page, um, again, this is very much from the perspective of what the minimum legal requirements were. A doctor will have to exercise his or her professional skill and judgment in deciding what risks the patient should be warned of and the terms in which the warning should be given. However, a doctor has a duty to warn patients of substantial or unusual risk inherent in any proposed treatment. This is especially so with surgery, but may apply to other procedures, including drug therapy and radiation treatment, and then reference again to the Sidaway case. And then the next page, please, Shamek. If we look at paragraph nine, which is just over halfway down the page. Consent given for one procedure or episode of treatment does not give any automatic right to undertake any further, uh, any other procedure. Um, uh, um, and then I should just refer to page 13, in which attention is drawn to the Sidaway case. So again, this is very much based upon um, explaining um, uh, what... Um, what was required um, in terms of legal responsibility or, or to avoid an action against the doctor. Um, there's, there's similar guidance from Scotland. Um, I, I'm not going to go to the detail of it because there's, there, are, there aren't material differences, but we can just we can see that from PRSE 40713. Um, Scottish Office National Health Service in Scotland Management Executive, dear colleague, a guide to consent to examination, investigating treatment or operation. And then we can see from paragraph one, it says the Department of Health issued in August 1990 its guide to consent for examination or treatment. That's the document we just looked at. Ministers agreed it was necessary to produce a similar guide for the use of health professionals in Scotland to maintain consistency throughout the UK in the area of patient consent. And then um, the, the guide um, uh, follows, but uh, as I say, it's in um, materially similar form. Uh, we then, now in, in the 90s, see um, more detailed guidance on consent from the British Medical Association. So if we go to BMAL 5089... Um, this is the BMA's 1993 publication, Medical Ethics Today, the, um, its practice and philosophy. And, and if we go in this document to page 7, we'll see that from the contents that the first chapter is about consent um, and refusal. And then if we go um, to page 27, please... Um, Show Mac. Sorry, actually, could we just pick it up? Page 22 in the introduction, so just so that we can see the purpose of this document. Um, aims of the book. This book is intended to be a practical guide which reflects contemporary ethical thinking. It's written primarily for doctors, but we hope that other people will find it useful. Its approach is patient-centered. So now we have the patient at the center of the guidance rather than uh, the clinician. And then the next paragraph, um, the fundamental principles observed by the medical profession remain constant, but their application to newly evolving situations requires debate. E each of these chapters centers on ethical questions which doctors raise with the BMA and attempts to show briefly how moral theories can be applied to these common dilemmas. 
And then if we go to page 27, shall I make, we can see the chapter on consent. And, and, and so we, we, we have here a much more detailed um, discussion about um, the, the uh, uh, principles. So under the heading introduction, the doctor-patient relationship, the relationship between doctor and patient is based on the concept of partnership and collaborative effort. Ideally, decisions are made through frank discussion in which the doctor's clinical expertise and the patient's individual needs and preferences are shared to select the best treatment option. Uh, the patient's consent to be examined and to receive treatment is the trigger which allows the interchange uh, to take place. Um, and if we look at the last sentence of that paragraph, regardless of how it's expressed, the basic premise is that treatment is undertaken as a result of patients being actively involved in deciding what is to be done to them. And then if we go to page 29, shall I make? Under the heading, the therapeutic relationship, as a prerequisite to choosing treatment, patients have the right to receive information from doctors and to discuss the benefits and risks of appropriate treatment options. Doctors give medical guidance as to the optimal course of action, but must also recognise that patients' responses will not be formed solely on the basis of clinical data, but by their circumstances, needs, rational conclusions and irrational emotions. Individuals have varied information requirements. Um, thus, a doctor uh, who seeks guidance about the amount or type of information which should be made available must first listen to the patient and consider, among other things, what it is that the patient wants to know. The next paragraph tells us patient consent must be voluntary, free from pressure, and derives from competence to decide. Uh, and then if we look at the third paragraph, um, it, it looks as it were the intertwining of law and ethics. In many aspects of medicine, the legal and ethical requirements are separate, and ethical guidance need make no reference to the law. Consent, however, is an issue which binds the two. Uh, next paragraph, it would be wrong to assume that consent is only relevant when initiating an examination or treatment. Consent is a process and not an event, and it is important that there be continuing discussion to reflect the evolving nature of treatment. And then we look at the bottom of the page. Clearly, the opportunity to consent to treatment is counterbalanced by a right to refuse it. Uh, and then there is a further discussion in relation to that. And then if we go to page 33... Bottom half of the page, under the heading Seeking Consent, we pick it up in the bottom paragraph. Some people see the purpose of consent as chiefly being the provision of a defence for doctors against legal liabilities, which come up for discussion when patients allege that their apparent agreement to treatment has been rendered invalid by the doctor's failure to give enough information for specific consent. In the BMA's view, respect for others and their rights, so there's that principle that you referred to, sir, I mean, in, in, in the earlier documents. So respect for others and their rights lies at the heart of the issue of consent. A feature of our present society is the emphasis on the value and dignity of the individual. It is said that principles of inherent natural rights dictate that each person who is competent to do so should decide what happens to his or her own body. The patient exercises this autonomy by, by deciding which treatment option to accept, the decision is based on information given by the clinician. For consent to be valid, the patient must know what options are available and have the ability to choose. And then if we go over the page. Uh, the guidance continues. In addition to the moral and symbolic importance of promoting patient self-determination, patient cooperation is a very practical requirement. Uh, and then picking that up in the second paragraph, um, this perhaps foreshadows current thinking that most people fare best when they have a clear view of what is being proposed and its implications. In the past, concern to avoid worrying patients has been seen as a reason for not telling them the full implications of either their condition or different options for treatment. Sometimes only their relatives were given information of the likely outcome. Even nowadays, doctors are often reluctant to mention medicine's ubiquitous uncertainties and arguments are made for restricting information in certain circumstances on the grounds that autonomy is not the only ethical imperative. It is sometimes argued that an exaggerated regard for this single principle puts at risk the whole concept of the doctor-patient relationship. Here, we take the opportunity to reaffirm that it is not the doctor's role just to provide a list of alternatives from which patients select options according to their needs and desires. 
doctors must indeed bear in mind other ethical principles, such as the duty of acting in the patient's best interest by attempting to recognise what the patient wants. In most cases, patients can choose better for themselves than doctors can choose for them, but occasionally the patient's final choice is to let the doctor choose. This is not an obligation of choice, and the patient who makes such a decision with regard to one aspect of treatment should not be seen as relinquishing choice on other issues. Nevertheless, whilst information and uncertainty should not be forced upon patients at a time when they're particularly vulnerable and clearly unready, most people do deal with very difficult choices despite their anxieties if given the support to do so. And then the bottom of the page picks up on the issue of communication. Information is only useful if it's provided in a manner intelligible to the hearer and at a pace at which the recipient um, can digest it. And then the BMA expresses concern that although schools, so that's medical schools, provide some form of communication skills training for medical students, relatively few are committed to formal instruction and students are not bound to achieve any particular standards. And then if we can go on to page 36, please show me, we, we can see um, a section headed provision of information. Um, reference is made to the Declaration of Lisbon, uh, which we've already looked at. Um, and, and then if I pick it up four lines down, um, how much or how little is considered to be adequate so in terms of the provision of information will vary with each patient. It must also be a matter of clinical judgment and the standards set by other doctors. From an ethical viewpoint, the criteria should be as much information as the patient needs or desires. Uh, and then in the next paragraph, again, we see the distinction between good practice and legal minimums. Um, and then if we go to the next page, top half of the page, um, there's a citation from, again, from the House of Lords in Sidaway, and then it says this, thus ideally the doctor should inform the patient about any risks inherent in the treatment which might be particularly important to that patient, as well as explaining the risks and benefits of alternatives and of non-treatment. Information allows the patient to make a rational decision, but decision-making is not solely a rational activity. It involves intuition, personal values, preferences, um, and emotion. And then again, there's a more detailed discussion about the exchange of information between doctor and patient. And then if we just look at the bottom half of this page, under the heading duration of consent, doctors often query the length of time for which patient consent be, can be considered valid. In usual practice, this is not a, a question, since consent is an evolving matter and not a once and for all decision. Um, so that's, uh, the, the, the chapter then goes on to look at the particular scenarios in which a patient cannot consent. So again, the unconscious patient and emergencies, children um, and parental rights to consent and impaired capacity. And I don't think we need to look at any of those um, materials. Um, so that's that's the 1995... Um, just just a, a, a comment uh, on, uh, on this. If one goes back to page 30, which I, I noticed as we slipped past it, is that electronic page 30? Electronic page 30. Okay. There's a, a heading, a paragraph, which is headed the autonomy of doctors. Now, there's no similar paragraph in respect of patients because, I suspect, the autonomy of a patient is uh, demonstrated throughout the yes. text. And it's maybe thought quite interesting that it is, as it were, necessary to spell out what autonomy a doctor has uh, when in the early 50s and 60s it might be said uh, the debate was about whether a patient had any. Yes. Yes, indeed. Uh, um, so that, that was the 1993. Um, there's then, um, let's just look at in passing, um, a publication from 1995 by the Royal College of Physicians. which is at RCPH 40404. So 00004044 underscore 003, please show that. Now this is specifically um, um, looking at the position of um, consent for patients undergoing treatment for cancer but nonetheless may be illuminating in terms of understanding some of the wider principles in, in, in play. 
Um, so we can see there is, it says there is an increasing demand for patients with cancer to receive better information about their disease and its treatment than has been customary in the past. And this is coupled with the issue of informed consent for treatment. Uh, and then there's specific reference to a, a, a declaration um, of the rights of people with cancer. Um, and if we just go down a few lines, that includes the right to be informed fully about treatment options and to have explained to me the benefits, side effects and risks of any treatment. Um, if we go over the page, just picking up the, the first line and a half, consent for treatment can no longer be assumed or implied by the patient presenting themselves for treatment. And then if we go to the next page under the heading current situation, as there can be no doubt that expectations regarding consent are changing and that in light of this, the legal position on consent is likely to reflect an increasing onus upon doctors to ensure that patients receive full information regarding treatment and its side effects before giving informed consent. Um, and then if we go a little further down, the, we see the delivery of information to patients can be regarded in three main areas. A discussion of the proposed treatment, alternative treatments and realistic expectations from treatment the process of treatment and then the possible toxicity of treatment. And then if we go to the next page, I'm not going to go through this in, in detail, but there are proposals for future practice as to how to make the delivery of information um, uh, um, really a, a more valuable and, and useful exercise. So little paragraph A talks about the consultation taking place in appropriate surroundings. Um, B talks about the, the ideal of the initial consultation being distant from the arrangements for treatment so the patient feels that a true choice is being offered rather than a fait accompli. Paragraph C talks about the provision of um, supporting written information in the form of patient information leaflets, which should cover not only the process of treatment but also alternative treatments, realistic expectations from treatment and both acute and late toxicities. And then if we go to the next page, we can see D is about patients being given the opportunity to ask for information beyond that which is volunteered by the clinician. E, um, all patients should have access to clarification and further information following the initial discussion. And F, it's important that there is full documentation of all advice given and of any written information leaflets or other backup material taken um, by um, the patient. Um, so that, that's, as I say, from the Royal College of Physicians um, specifically in the context of, of cancer care. Uh, and then um, just uh, two final documents to note on the topic of consent in um, the 1990s. There's the GMC's 1995 publication, Good Medical Practice. We looked at that this morning. I'm not proposing to go back to it. But that talked about the rights of patients to be fully involved in decisions about their care and the right to refuse treatment. Um, um, and then, uh, and this document I do want to look at, um, is the GMC's um, first specific guidance on consent. That's at PRSE 303177, please show me it. And we can see this is being issued by the GMC in November 1998, seeking patients' consent, the ethical considerations. And as I say, it's our understanding it's the first specific piece of guidance issued by the General Medical Council on the question of consent. If we go to the second page, uh, second paragraph, this booklet sets out the principles of good practice which all registered doctors are expected to follow when seeking patients informed consent to investigations, treatment, screening or research. Um, I should say, so this, is a, um, this is a later version, so although... November 1998 appears on the first page. We can see from references here to the 2006 version of good medical practice has been inserted. The inquiry doesn't currently have the, the, the original version, so we're not quite clear at the moment of the extent to which there were amendments. Um, but again, much of this is by way of um, what, what the ethicists told us are, are well-established long-standing principles. Uh, we see under the heading introduction, again, the reference to trust. To establish that trust, you must respect patients' autonomy, their right to decide whether or not to undergo any medical intervention, even where a refusal may result in harm to themselves or in their own death. 
patients must be given sufficient information in a way they can understand to enable them to exercise their right to make informed decisions about their care. Paragraph three, first sentence, explains that effective communication is the key to enabling patients to make informed decisions. And then if we go further down the page, um, we'll see um, the heading, consent to investigation and treatment, providing sufficient information. Uh, and then um, if we just pick it up, perhaps at paragraph five, the bottom of the page, the information which patients want or ought to know before deciding whether to consent to treatment or an investigation may include details of the diagnosis and prognosis and the likely prognosis of the condition is left untreated, uncertainties about the diagnosis, including options for further investigation prior to treatment, options for treatment or management of the condition, including the option not to treat, and then top of the next page, the purpose of a proposed investigation or treatment, details of the procedures or therapies involved, uh, and then the next bullet point for each option, explanations of the likely benefits and the probabilities of success and discussion of any serious or frequently occurring risks and of any lifestyle changes which may be caused by or necessitated by treatment, advice about whether a proposed treatment is experimental uh, and um, so uh, on. Um, and then uh, I, I'm not going to go through the detail of the remainder of it, but if we go to the next page, we can just see some of the headings. So responding to questions talks about the, um, the importance of responding honestly to any questions the patient raises. Withholding information. You should not withhold information necessary for decision making unless you judge the disclosure of some relevant information would cause the patient serious harm. And importantly this, in this context, serious harm does not mean the patient would become upset or decide to refuse treatment. So a doctor's not entitled to decline to provide information because he or she thinks that that will lead to the patient refusing treatment, which the doctor thinks the patient should have. And again, that resonates very much in, in the context of some of the evidence that the inquiry has heard. Um, uh, so that's, um, uh, again, it's, it's a document that merits um, uh, reading in full. It also has a section on consent um, to research. Um, but, but that's the, the, the GMC's position in relation to consent. Um, there's also, um, I think perhaps finally on the topic of, of consent, a, a publication by the British Medical Association specifically in relation to children. Um, and that is at GMCO 40679, I think. Yes. Um, you'll see here, sir, it says confidential and strictly confidential, but there are also references um, in the course of the document to it, it being available to patients and so on. So we, we've assumed that at some point it became a published um, um, report. Um, uh, again, I'm, I'm not going to go through it in, in any detail. I, I think I'll just show you, sir, the contents list so we can see the kind of um, um, uh, uh, issues that are being covered in this particular document. So if we go to page two, we see chapter one is about is an ethical approach to treating children and young people, so placing ethical principles really at the forefront of this report. Chapter two then looks at the legal framework um, and then if we go to the next page, we'll see at the bottom half of the page, there's a, there's a whole chapter, chapter five, on non-treatment and refusal of treatment. Um, so it, it's, um, uh, a, a, again, a, a detailed discussion of the principles of consent in the particular context here uh, of providing treatment to or offering treatment to children. Um, so, so those are the principal materials that the inquiry has um, uh, obtained um, that bear on the question of consent in terms of the guidance given to, to clinicians. Um, the, the next topic I'm proposing to turn to is the, the issue of confidentiality. And um, uh, we can either happy to start now or take lunch early, whichever's easiest for you, sir. Well, it's probably sensible to have it in one, one go, isn't yes. it? Yes. So um, let's take a break now until uh, 10 to 2. Thank you, sir. 10 to 2.